Here we go in three, two, and one. Amen. There you go. You're going to be starting back slowly with what's in the meetings. The first one is this coming Wednesday, January 27th from 6 to 7.30. Thank you, Lord. They're going to need a schedule yeah. with this schedule through May 26th and then plan to come back weekly with the regular schedule in August. Adult workers are needed, so please contact the Howards or Rachel Jackson to join the team. And I think there's more information in your bulletin for contact address and I want the information and things like that. Um, and um, close to my part, community yeah. outreach is gearing back up. And we've got some exciting things planned. So if you have a heart for the community and would like to join our team, would you please give me a call or send me a text? Um, my number is on the bulletin. We will also host a worship concert um, Saturday, February 20th at 7 p.m. So please mark your Oh, you already have the lights, right? Um, just in case. Yeah, can you lie while they switch, right? Please do lie. And then, yeah. Yeah. And that gives you time to. So, if you get back on. Um, let's take a time to come and worship with her. She does that. And lastly, giving statements are available through CCB. However, if you can just print it, all you need to do is call the church office. Um, and you're getting some more contact information in your bulletins. So, everybody needs to really read their bulletin today because there's lots of information in there. All right, thank you guys, and let's worship the Lord. Okay. Okay, All right, well, I have a few announcements of my own here. Um, we, as the people of God, have been called to take the gospel, uh, not just to Avila, but to all around the world, and uh, there's an idea that I've had that I've not been able to talk to anyone about yet, so uh, if Amy Meyer is watching this and I get in trouble for uh, doing this, then uh, I'll take that flag. Um, we have a tip jar here. No, this is not for you tipping me while I'm preaching, uh, but one of the things I'd like to do for, with this is uh, to put this outside at our coffee station, um, and when you grab coffee, uh, if you have any change, if your kids get allowance and they want to bring change, what we want to do with this we want to be able to save this up and to uh, send presents to our missionaries. Um, as you guys see, we have missionary highlights out there by our um, by our coffee station. And so they have birthdays just like you do, anniversaries just like you do. Uh, they are on a uh, very fixed budget um, because they're on support. They get impacted by COVID just like you do. They have fears of what happens if supporters drop off just like you do. So we want to be able to use this money to bless our missionaries at just the right time. So we will continue that monthly support no matter what, but this is for them and to bless them. So if you have change in your car and you're like, I don't know what to do with it, you can put it in the tip jar and that will be emptied out every Sunday. Also, I just want to challenge you. You know, many of us over the last year have talked about the fears of what might happen uh, if President Biden got elected and uh, would begin a pro-abortion campaign. Well, friends, just like we thought it would, it happened. Now it's time to put our money where our mouth is. If we actually care about pro-life, if we actually care about serving the unborn, then I'm calling you to sign up on the outreach team. It will not be solved through politics. It will be solved by you discipling young mothers. It will be solved by you sharing the gospel with young fathers. It will be done by you holding babies who were once in danger by the Lord and then discipling, mentoring, and training those out. We had the sincere pleasure of getting to walk through First Look's new building and praying over it on Friday. And it is an amazing building, and they have rooms for Bible studies. The, uh, one of the, the presidents there mentioned that they have so many things that they could do, they're just coming up with ideas. And so, friends, 
Everybody that went to you have said over the last year, put your money where your mouth is. Join the outreach team. Be watching. Be praying. And go do what Christ has called us to do. Okay? Let's pray and let's get ready for worship today. Father God, we thank you for an opportunity to worship you. Father God, we live in a crazy world. We live in a world run by men. Lord, and there are no good solutions among those men. So God, we just come today on this cold and wet and dreary day after a week filled with hardships, with loss, sadness, after a week filled with fear and trepidation, we come to you asking you to fix our eyes on our King, who himself will make all things right, who himself will undo every bad and sad thing. Father, we put our hopes in no man. We put our hopes in Jesus. We sing the praises of no men, but we will sing the praise of Jesus. So today, Father, I pray that in Jesus' name and for Jesus' glory, you will break us, shape us, change us to be people made in his image. So that the world will know the gospel and know the peace of reconciliation with God. And we pray this in your son's name. Amen. Good morning. You know, our hearts long for the day when illnesses, death, injustice, and all forms of evil will cease to exist. When God's kingdom is completely established and fulfilled here on earth, and that time we will praise Him forever. But until that day comes, we stand together and sing with hearts filled with hope, as we know that His grace and His glory is shining in and through us. 2 Corinthians 4, verses 16 to 18, says, So we do not lose heart, though our outer self is wasting away, our inner self is being renewed day by day. For this light momentary affliction is preparing for us an eternal weight of glory beyond all comparison. As we look to things that are not, that are seen, as we not, sorry, as we look not to the things that are seen, but to the things that are unseen. For the things that are seen are transient, but the things that are unseen are eternal. So let's stand together and let us meditate on this and exalt God's, God's greatness together and sing together. Yeah. 
majestic is your name, how powerful you are. Father, it is such a joy to be in your presence. It is such a joy to have the Holy Spirit living within us. Father, we are here to praise you. We are here to honor you. We are here to adore you. Father, may our lives express this. May our voices express this as we continue to praise your holy name. His 
his hands, his feet, my Savior on that cursed tree. His body bowed and drenched in tears, they laid him down.
we stand and lift up our hands for the joy of the Lord is our strength we bow down and worship him now how great how awesome is he and together we see everyone see holy is the lord god almighty the earth is filled with his glory holy is the lord god almighty the earth is filled with his glory the earth joy of the Lord is our strength. We bow down and worship Him now. How great, how awesome is He. Together we see. Everyone see. All together. Holy is the Lord. Holy is the Lord. God Almighty. of your glory everywhere we are in this world filled with darkness and brokenness we can be alive for you father as you shine your light in us we praise you and ask that you will receive these songs as an offering of our praise and love we love you in your name we pray amen and i ask please to remain standing just a little bit more for scripture reading Matthew chapter 17, verses 1 to 13. 13. And after six days, Jesus took with him Peter and James and John, his brother, and led them up a high mountain by themselves. And he was transfigured before them, and his face shone like the sun, and his clothes became white as light. And behold, there appeared to them Moses and Elijah, talking with him. And Peter said to Jesus, Lord, it is good that we are here. If you wish, I will make three tents here, 
one for you and one for Moses and one for Elijah. He was still speaking when, behold, a bright cloud overshadowed them, and a voice from the cloud said, This is my beloved Son, with whom I am well pleased. Listen to him. When the disciples heard this, they fell on their faces and were terrified. But Jesus came and touched them, saying, Rise and have no fear. And when they lifted up their eyes, they saw no one but Jesus only. And as they were coming down the mountain, Jesus commanded them, Tell no one the vision until the Son of Man is raised from the dead. And the disciples asked him, Then why did the scribes say that first Elijah must come? He answered, Elijah does come, and he will restore all things. But I tell you that Elijah has already come, and they did not recognize him, but did to him whatever they pleased. So also the Son of Man will certainly suffer at their hands. Then the disciples understood that he was speaking to them of John the Baptist. You may be seated. Father God, as we go through Matthew 17 and we look at Jesus' transfiguration, Father, I pray, God, that you will give us a vision of Christ's sweet, glorious, warm face. Lord, let us be moved and changed and transformed as we behold his glory. We pray this in your son's name. Amen. Around AD 67 or 68... We uh, find Peter sitting there more than 30 years after Jesus' death and resurrection as a scarred, seasoned servant of Christ writing to the church. He has endured years of suffering, including beatings and death threats lobbed at him by the Sanhedrin and imprisonments like the time he was placed on death row by Herod Agrippa. He had seen good times like the time that Cornelius and his whole family Uh, of Romans, put their trust in Jesus. He grieved the loss of close friends like James, who was beheaded by King Herod, the same King Herod who had already tried to kill him. So by the time we find Peter writing his last letter in 2 Peter, he is more or less a year away from being executed by Emperor Nero. So when you're reading 2 Peter, You're reading his last correspondence with the church before he dies. So as we look at this scarred, seasoned, weathered apostle, one wonders what made it all worth it. Why did he carry those scars? Why did he bear all that suffering? What was it that kept him going through it all? Well, we don't have to wonder. Because he tells us in 2 Peter chapter 1, verses 16 to 18, Peter looks back on the beautiful memory of standing with Jesus on the mountain that we're going to read about today. And the beauty of his words resonate as he writes, For we did not follow cleverly devised myths when we made known to you the power and coming of our Lord Jesus Christ, but we were eyewitnesses of his majesty. For when, we re- when he received honor and glory from God the Father, and the voice was borne to him by the majestic glory, this is my beloved Son, with whom I am well pleased, we ourselves heard this very voice born from heaven, for we were with him on the holy mountain. And we have the prophetic word more fully confirmed, to which you will do well to pay attention as to a lamp shining in a dark place. Until the day dawns and the morning star rises in your hearts. Here Peter elaborates on the center of his hope. Peter, what was it that made you take the whip? What was it that made the cold nights in the prison worthwhile? What was it that made the death threats, the the threats to be stoned, the threats to be crucified? What was it that gave you courage even in the face of a God-hating Caesar who would eventually crucify you upside down? His answer is simple. I've seen the glory of Christ. I've seen Jesus and his face. I've heard the voice of God proclaiming, this is my beloved son in whom I am well pleased. And that's his answer to us. That's what 
is the secret to him being able to bear his cross. My friends, we've just been told in Matthew 16 that all disciples have crosses to bear. If we are to be disciples of Jesus, we must take up the cross and follow him. And yet it's this text in Matthew 17 that is hugely effective and motivating us to embrace the suffering that awaits us. As we study Jesus' transfiguration in Matthew 17, we are given a preview of our glorious King. And in turn, we are given inspiration to take up our own suffering as we follow Him. So in the last section of Matthew, just to kind of, if you're new with us today, we've been walking through Matthew for a little over a year, and it's just amazing how God's perfect timing matches what we're going through with every single text. Peter confessed Jesus as the Christ, as the King. Jesus began teaching his disciples that the King must suffer. As the Christ, he had to have the cross. Peter obviously struggled with this and attempted to correct Jesus, but was told that anyone who wanted to follow him must be willing to suffer, even crucifixion. Now, the comparison of discipleship as crucifixion, as we saw just a few weeks ago, is a dark metaphor, and to say the least, uh, to, it's a dark metaphor to say the least, and by itself, if we had nothing else but Matthew 16, we might be left in some form of despondency, wouldn't we? Can you imagine if the very last words of Jesus, or the very last action of Jesus, was to tell you that as a disciple, you would suffer some horrendous things, and that's it? Well, Jesus doesn't do that. Jesus does tell us we must suffer But then he gives us a glimpse at the reward for why we suffer. He tells us the bitter truth that we are going to bear crosses. And then he gives us a glimpse of his resurrection glory so that we can bear those crosses more effectively. My friends, you will certainly suffer, but your suffering is not in vain. Because beyond the cross that you carry awaits a resurrection glory in Christ himself. The transfiguration has long been held as a significant moment in the life and ministry of Jesus. We we all know about the Mount of Transfiguration. We all know about the moment when Jesus is transfigured into this glorious being who is bright and shining and emanating glory. But few of us really understand what's happening on this mountain. Given that Jesus mentions his suffering just right before and then throughout this transfiguration, we have to read the transfiguration in light of his upcoming cross, his soon coming passion and the empty tomb. In many ways, we can think of the visible transformation of Jesus as a preview of what's to happen after the tomb. I mean, the disciples have just had their way Uh, destroyed. What they wanted from the Christ has just been obliterated. They wanted a king to reign, to have victory over their enemies, to set up Israel as a glorious kingdom. And they've just been told that Jesus is not going to waylay the Romans. He's not going to embarrass the Pharisees. He's going to die on the cross, suffer, be buried, and rise again. We need some kind of glimpse that that's okay. Some kind of affirmation that that is indeed God's plan. And so the transfiguration is is God's preview of, yes, this is what's going to happen to the Christ. But look at what Christ will be at the resurrection. Now, as a result, I think that Jesus shows us a glimpse of his post-resurrection glory on this mountain he shows Peter a glimpse of it. And as you are, have already seen in 2 Peter chapter 1, it stayed with Peter throughout his entire life. Can you imagine having seen Jesus in such a way? And then someone threatens you that if you continue to speak the name of Christ, they'll kill you. Having seen the glory of Jesus, having heard the voice of God himself speak about Jesus, <laughs> okay. It's worthwhile. It's, it's, a, it's a noble cost. To suffer for Jesus, knowing that we have the risen and glorious King, 
is worthwhile to bear crosses knowing that we have the risen king who emanates glory and has promised that for us makes all of our suffering worth it. And so I have a simple hope today. My hope is that as you glimpse Jesus in the text and you come to know Jesus as the son of glory, as the one who emanates the glory of God himself, that we as disciples will be ready to faithfully plod through the miry swamps of suffering, knowing that we are not called to live in the miry swamps. We are called through the miry swamps to come to the glorious Savior who waits on the other side. Now, Matthew is a literary genius. I mean, I, I don't know if you know this about the biblical writers. They weren't some rudimentary elementary writers. They are literary geniuses in the way they work in old themes and echoes and whispers of old redemptive stories into their text. Well, we see Matthew doing that. He weaves Old Testament motifs and themes and details into this transfiguration. And by the end of it, you're left, you're left saying, wow, look at Jesus. So we're going to look at some of these details. We're going to look at some of these themes. First, we have a mountain. Six days after Jesus' discussion about discipleship and crosses, he and three of his disciples, Peter, James, and John, ascend a high mountain. Now, from a whole biblical perspective, we know that amazing things happen on mountains. We think of Mount Sinai and God's appearance in a cloud of glory and the way that he spoke in thunder. Or perhaps you think of Mount Carmel and the way that uh, Elijah called down fire from God that burnt up the altar. Maybe Mount Horeb, where Elijah spoke with God in a still, small voice. The point is, is that as careful Bible readers, we see Jesus ascending this mountain, and we're left wondering, okay, what's about to happen? Important men of God have ascended mountains before. How is this time going to be different? In other mountain-related stories... The prophet ascends the mountain to see God's glory. Moses goes up to Mount Sinai with the request that he would be able to see God's face, to see God's glory. Ask God explicitly, show me your glory. And he comes down with a face that glows. Just the residual glory of God resting on his face. But then it eventually fades. But that's not what we find happening with Jesus. Jesus doesn't go up the mountain to see God's glory. Jesus goes up the, the mountain to display God's glory. He goes up to shine God's glory. He goes up to reveal God's glory, to pull back the veil. And the difference doesn't end there. This is a glory that doesn't fade. He doesn't need to come back into God's presence, get a little more of the glory glow, and then come back out. He is the glory glow forever and ever and ever, and it emanates from Him. He's not just someone that reflects God's glory. He emits it. It emanates from Him, exudes from Him. So when we see Jesus with His face shining like a sun, His clothes becoming white as light, we see the Jesus who is the one who is the source of God's glory itself. Perhaps this is what John had in mind when he described in his gospel, and the word became flesh and tabernacled among us. And we have seen his glory, glory as the only son from the Father, full of grace and truth. Notice that John says we have seen his glory. He doesn't say we have seen God's glory reflected in him. No, it says, we have seen his glory. For John, Jesus' glory is God's glory. God's glory is Jesus' glory. Jesus is himself the very radiance of God's glory. My friends, can we, can, I know that this is very cerebral here. I know that it's, it's very abstract to talk about the glory of God. But can we just bask in how amazing this is? Not one single human being in the history of the world has ever emitted God's glory from himself. Again, reflected, yes. Glue, sure. But to shine in and of themselves, that's brand new. I mean, it's almost as if when they see Jesus, they walked into the Holy of Holies. It's almost when they see Jesus, God himself, and not almost, it is. 
God himself has made himself known. The subtle detail of Jesus' shining face and white clothes and the fact that this light emanates from him shows us that if you're to behold the glory of God, you must behold it in Christ. My friends, how often do we look underneath other rocks to to find God's glory? Maybe we'll see God's glory here. Maybe we'll see God's glory here. And Scripture tells us it is found in no one but Jesus. If you want to see the beautiful sight of God's warm, loving, gracious, bright presence, there's only one place you can go to. Now, in addition to Jesus radiating glory, we find two very significant people talking with him. Can you imagine just walking up the mountain with your Messiah, with your rabbi, and suddenly, out of nowhere, he starts glowing, and then with him show up Moses and Elijah. I mean, that would be the most phenomenal coffee date I think I've ever had. (laughs) I do believe Moses drank coffee, so. Either way... These two discussion partners come up, Moses and Elijah. Now, Matthew himself doesn't tell us what uh, Moses and Elijah and Jesus were talking about, but Luke does. Luke tells us they were talking about his soon coming departure, which in Greek is exodon, his exodus. In other words, Moses, the one who was part of the first exodus, and Elijah, the one who anticipates a second exodus, comes together with the one who's going to bring the ultimate exodus. And they're discussing that. Can you imagine this conversation with Moses saying, you know, I wrote about you long, long ago. Can you tell me how you feel about the upcoming cross? Can you imagine Elijah saying, I called people to repentance because of this very moment. I knew you were coming. And here you are. I mean, both of these prophets, Moses and Elijah, had ascended mountains in search for God's glory. And now here they are on the mountain with the one who is God's glory himself. Moses wanted to see God's face and God said, you can't, you'll die, but I will pass by you and you will see a glimpse of my glory. Now he sees the face of God unveiled. And all of us are left wondering, wow. There are many prophets in Israel's Old Testament days, but these particular prophets represent the Old Testament, uh, the Old Testament testimony of the one who was to come. Moses is often associated with the law, right? So you, you talk about the law, you're, gonna, you're bound to talk about Moses, who's the one that gave the law on the, on the tablets. Um, and it it, you also think of this prophet like, uh, this Moses like prophet that's to come from Moses. He spoke of him in Deuteronomy 18 15. And it's this prophet, this Moses like prophet that everyone is supposed to listen and obey the word of God. And then we get to Elijah, who's symbolic of repentance. I mean, this is the prophet who called people to repent. So you get law and repentance right here. Okay, the two prophets that preach these, these, these are the mascots of the Old Testament prophets. With them being there, these two representatives are representing the entire prophetic testimony. Nathan, David, I mean, you you name it. Any Old Testament prophet, they're all represented here with these two prophets. And as these two prophets speak with Christ, we see that the entire prophetic testimony is fulfilled in Jesus. Everything they said. My friends, we as Westerners, number one, we don't give too much serious thought to prophecy. That seems hokey and really, really old anyway. But to the early church, the fact that Jesus fulfilled the word of God as spoken in the prophets was a phenomenal thing. Let me just paint the picture. Your Old Testament from Genesis to Malachi spans 4,000 years. 4,000 years. It was written by various different voices. You get regal kings like David, right? You get tree shepherds, tree, tree uh, people, arborists, I guess is what you call them, <laughs> like Amos. I mean, that guy, his job was to pluck figs off of a tree. You get people who married prostitutes like Hosea. You get stuttering prophets like Moses. 
And you get all this prophetic testimony and all these various people from kings to poor people spread over 4,000 years. And guess what? They all speak with one unified voice. There is one to come who will crush the head of the serpent, who will restore God's blessing in the world, will bring everlasting shalom, and will turn back sin and death itself. And there stands Jesus. This is the one for whom the whole world has waited for, the one whom all the prophets searched and inquired carefully so as to know what time he would suffer and how he would suffer and who he would be. And now here they are standing on the mountain with him. Now, Peter sees Jesus standing with Moses and Elijah, and I want to cut Peter some slack here. I'm not sure what I would have said, okay? So before we get into Peter's offer and what he says, I'm just the dumb sort of guy that would have said something maybe even dumber, okay? So I just just want to be clear. Let's cut Peter some slack here. What he says is actually not that dumb. He's, he's, He's actually being pretty smart. He knows his Bible, When he sees Peter, Jesus, and Elijah all talking together, and he sees Jesus shining like the Shekinah glory of God from the Old Testament, he offers to build three tents. He says, it's good, you you brought us here. We can be the ones to build the tents. What, What does he mean by tents? Why does he think tents would be appropriate? Well, he sees the glory that's emanating from Jesus. And in the entire biblical testimony, there's only one place that that glory belongs, in a tabernacle. And so he's offering, great, brand new glory, amazing glory with a man. Let's build him a tent to house this glory. Now, the problem with Peter's offer, I mean, it's the, it's the right inclination. Glory in the past belonged in the tabernacle. So essentially, he's offering, let me be the new Bezalel or the new Othiel who will b- make the blueprints for the tabernacle and I'll build it, I'll work, I'll get the donations and I'll... How's your glory in this tabernacle? The problem was, was that his offer was essentially, essentially huge steps backwards in God's redemptive plan. You see, Jesus, as the glorious Son of God, had not come with a glory that was meant to be veiled or to be put into a tent. He came so that people could behold God's glory without the tent, without the veil. This hope is consistent with what Paul says in 2 Corinthians 3. But when one trusts in the Lord, when, but when one turns in to the Lord, the veil is removed, and we all with unveiled face, beholding the glory of God, are being transformed into the same uh, into the same image from one degree of glory to another. So in Jesus, here's what's happening here as this glory is emanating. He doesn't need a new tabernacle. He doesn't need a new tent. He doesn't need a veil. He doesn't need any of these old covenant things. He's come to bring something new. He's come to pull back the veil. He's come to rip the curtains. He's come to tear down the separation fences. He's come to bring down the tent so that you could walk with the glory of God. And so that you could behold it with an unveiled face and approach the glory of God freely in Christ. Verse 5 says that he was still speaking when a bright cloud overshadowed them. Again, if you think back to Exodus, you know exactly what this cloud is. Or better, we know who is in this cloud. After the tabernacle was completed in Exodus 40, a bright cloud overshadowed the tabernacle and descended on it. That was, they called it God's Shekinah glory. It's God's visible glory in a cloud. And it overshadowed and filled the tent so thick that even Moses and the priests could not go into the tent and do their job because God's presence was so thick in the place. You see it again in 2 Chronicles chapter 5 when the temple's built. Again, the shadow shows up. The, the cloud shows up. It overshadows the temple, fills the temple. Priests aren't able to go into it. And now here we have the same cloud coming again. This time without temple, this time without tent, but only with Jesus. Now I think the simple point is this. If you want to dwell with God, you no longer need tent, tabernacle, or temple. If you want to enjoy the dwelling presence of God, you need Jesus. He is the new temple. He is the place we go to meet with God and see God's glory. 
I mean, this is, a, this is an ultimate rebuke. Peter's he's, he's pulling out his parchment. We're making blueprints for the tabernacle now. And then without the tabernacle, the, sh- the, the cloud comes and overshadows. Basically, shut up, Peter. I'm doing something here. And the fact that we don't have a tabernacle, the fact that there's no tent, and that the cloud comes down on Jesus shows that free access has been opened through him. My friends, do you hear the beauty of that message? Can I, can I just tell you that again? Access to the God of the universe. Access to your creator who loves you more than anyone else in this earth could ever ever love you. Access to the God who made your insides. Access to the God who knows your future. Access to the God who wrote your days. Access to the God who knows the hairs on your head has been opened freely. And all that through Jesus Christ. Now, I just want to make a simple point of application and implication for believers. Um, It's very subtle in the text. Here it is. It's super profound, I think. God does not need your suggestions. <laughs> I'm positive. I'm, I'm sure, again, Peter was smart. He, he knew the Old Testament scriptures. He knew that glory properly placed belonged in a tabernacle. But God didn't need his suggestions for what should happen in redemptive history. God was doing something. Something that was already going on. Something that was already in progress. Long before the words, let there be light, were spoken, this plan was already made. This moment was already settled. God has demonstrated that all we will ever need to enjoy his presence is Jesus. But think of all the ways we suggest new tabernacles. Yeah, yeah, I've got Jesus, but can I build a tent over here in my career, Lord? Surely I can experience your glory there. Yeah, yeah, I've got Jesus, but can I build a tent over here in my opinions? Surely your glory will be displayed through that, as we all know. No. The ultimate tabernacle, the ultimate temple has been given. And Jesus' glory, God's glory, is housed in Christ through Jesus and is in Christ that we have all we need for access with God. We don't need to fear anything, right? We don't need to fear it being taken away because we have Jesus. No man gave us Jesus. No man gave us this temple. And no man can take this temple away. Jesus told the authorities, destroy this temple and in three days I'll rise it again. And he did. And we have the presence of God forever and ever. Regardless of legislation, regardless of people's actions, regardless of what people think, we have the glory of God in the temple of Jesus, who himself is God in flesh. Now, Peter, duly corrected, does the only appropriate thing When he hears the voice of God, he falls on his face and he trembles. And a voice from the cloud said, This is my beloved son with whom I am well pleased. Listen to him. God's words are saturated with redemptive significance and reveal who Jesus really is. You find three different parts to God's statement here. He is my beloved son, which points to his role as the Davidic king. My beloved son points back to Psalm 2, points back to 2 Samuel 7, where God identifies the new King David as his son, this new Davidic king. Now, the words, with whom I'm well pleased, can be found verbatim in Isaiah 42.1 when it's in reference to the suffering servant. So not only is Jesus the Davidic king, but he is also the suffering servant. Peter knew he was the Davidic king, but needed to hear he had also come to be the suffering servant. He wasn't one without the other king and servant. And not only that, God says, to him you must listen, which points back to Deuteronomy 18.15, to the prophet who would be like Moses. King, servant, prophet. That's who Jesus was. All the redemptive roles 
of the Old Testament culminate and focus on Christ. This Nazarene carpenter whom so many were rejecting. They were rejecting their king. The Isianic servant who would die, who would be wounded so that they could be healed. And the prophet who would speak face to face with God. Reject though they did, God's words vindicate who he really is. Now, with all these familiar redemptive things, we do find something completely unexpected in this text. There's a lot of things that are happening in this text that show the continuity between the Old Testament and the New Testament. There are things happening that are familiar with with what God has shown before, but there's some new things too. Whenever God's people saw God's cloud of glory come down, they fell down and trembled and were greatly afraid. Exodus 20 says that the people of Israel were so afraid at the sight of God's smoke and thunder that they begged Moses to go and speak to God for them. Now, throughout the scripture, there's a holy fear of God. Okay, That fear of God is always noble, always good, must always be there, and that fear of God never goes away. That's not what this fear of God is. In Exodus 20, they have a fear not even to approach God. The fear of God proper drives us to God. The fear they had in Exodus 20 drove them away from God. They didn't even want to hear God's voice. They trembled greatly. They say, you go for us, Moses. We'll stand far off over here. And then you tell us what God says. Because he terrifies us. That's what happened in Exodus 20. Now... We find something different in Matthew 17. We have the familiar mountain, so we have kind of a new Sinai. We have a familiar bright cloud. We have a familiar voice, a booming voice of God, and even a familiar reaction. The disciples fell on their faces and were terrified. But then comes a new peace. Verse 7 through 8. But Jesus came and touched them. Can you imagine? You're falling on your face. You're absolutely terrified because God has shown up on the scene in the cloud. Everything in you tells you that if you behold God without the temple, without the tabernacle, without a priest, without some kind of ritual cleaning, you are dead. They expect death. That's what they expect. They're absolutely terrified. But instead of the word of God coming and slaying them dead, they get the gentle hand of Jesus touching their back. Rise and have no fear. That's interesting, isn't it? Rise and have no fear. And when they lifted their eyes, they saw no one but Jesus only. What might the words rise and have no fear communicate about Jesus and what he has come to do? His words show us that Jesus has come to bring reconciliation between God and man. Those who trust in Jesus no longer need to fear approaching the presence of God. Now understand, he's not negating the fear of the Lord, the fear that drives us to God. He is negating the need to run away from God. He's he's negating the fact that you no longer have to shrink back. He's canceling that out. You can now approach. What Jesus says here, rise and have no fear, paves the way for Hebrews 4.16. Let us then with confidence, with boldness. That's the word that's used. Draw near to the throne of grace that we may receive mercy and find grace to help in time of need. Or consider Hebrews 10. Therefore, brothers, since we have boldness, confidence, to enter the holy places by the blood of Jesus, by the new and living way that he opened for us through the curtain that is through his flesh, and since we have a great high priest over the house of God, what then? Let us draw near. With a true heart, in full assurance of faith, with our hearts sprinkled clean from an evil conscience, and our bodies washed with pure water. In other words, Jesus died, suffered, was buried, and rose again 
so that you can have a bold and confident relationship with God. My friends, you don't have to be a kitten in God's presence. Why do we so often, I mean, we, we, we jump at the opportunity to speak with other people and to do other things and to, you know, do all these other things, but we're so slow to enter into the presence of God. Now, God wouldn't want to hear from me. Now, you don't understand, God's run the other way from me by this point of the week. Now, the things I did on Saturday have canceled all that access out. My friends, who are we to think that our sins and our flaws and our, our rebellion, our fickleness is enough to overcome the cross of Christ? Your past, just to be frank, is not powerful enough to cancel out what Jesus did on the cross. Your sins, your sexual promiscuity, whatever it was, your addictions your hate-filled relationship, your brokenness, all of that, quite frankly, is not strong enough to show back the curtain that Jesus ripped. Don't give yourself that much credit. Instead, bask in the free presence of God. Come boldly. You sin, Jesus wants you to come to the throne of grace. That's why he calls it the throne of grace, the mercy seat. It's the moment when we are deep, deep in sin that we should be approaching the throne of grace. It's that moment that we feel filthy, that we should be running to the presence of God. Yes, in the past it was running from. Now we run to and we run boldly knowing that we have a blood-bought access. So it's on this mountain that God shows His eternal purpose. And the eternal purpose is that he would make himself known through Christ so that we can have boldness and access with confidence through our faith in Jesus. So friends, it's through the transfiguration that we're given a glimpse of what's to come through Jesus. Can you imagine having that image of Christ in your heart, how that might motivate you to endure all things just to see him? To give up life, limb, liberty, happiness, just to have Christ. To crucify it all. To die terribly. Just to have Jesus. And to go even further than that, to say, yeah, my rights, my liberties, my happiness, my wealth, all these things, my prosperity, are trash compared to knowing Christ. But it's by having this image of Christ that we learn to find who is more valuable than all, who is worth more than it all. Now, as Jesus and his disciples begin to descend down the mountain, Jesus instructs his disciples to tell no one the vision. Don't tell anyone what you just saw until the Son of Man is raised from the dead. Now, that seems strange to us. Why would Jesus, if if I were Jesus and these people had just seen the best side of me, right? I think I would want everybody to know. Like, go, go tell not just the others, right? Go tell everybody that you've just seen. Well, he says, don't tell them until after the resurrection, Why? Because they simply cannot understand what they had just seen until after the resurrection. The transfiguration makes no sense unless Jesus rose from the grave. Jesus knows that if if they went and they blabbed it to everyone, the moment he died, it would make that look like a big confusing mess, maybe a lie even. Maybe a big conspiracy that Peter, James, and John wrote on the way down the mountain just to give some credential to Jesus. But it's after the resurrection that we're like, absolutely, that happened. 
Absolutely, he's the glorified son of God. Absolutely, he's the king. Absolutely, he's the suffering servant. Absolutely, he's the prophet like Moses. Absolutely, he's the savior for whom all the world has waited. Now, naturally, the disciples are scratching their heads. And why does the scribes say that Elijah must come first? So they're getting sidetracked again by all these different things. They just saw Elijah. He's not coming down with them. So, so why hasn't Elijah come first? They were absolutely right according to Malachi chapter 4, verse 5 through 6. Elijah, or a Elijah-like prophet, must come before the Messiah. So where is he? It's then that Jesus says, well, he's already come, but nobody recognized him. In fact, they didn't recognize him. They killed him. Now, who do you think he's talking about at that moment? It's John the Baptist. The Elijah-like prophet who had come preaching repentance and calling people out to repent, calling down sins of even King Herod himself and who lost his head because of it. So Jesus answers their question, but then he redirects to the cross. So also will the Son of Man certainly suffer at their hands. Certainly suffer. Now, I can imagine Peter going, uh And then remembering that the voice from the cloud just told him to shut up and listen to Jesus. So I can just imagine Peter's still probably struggling with this, but he just saw Jesus transformed into this amazing, glorious figure, and this amazing, glorious figure is going to die. Once again, Jesus centers the focus on his impending death. Just as the disciples will not fully understand Jesus' glory until after the resurrection, they also must view his glory through the lens of the cross. You understand that the cross magnifies the glory of Christ. It doesn't diminish it. His glory is set on full display. We might have this little glimpse of Jesus in his glory in Matthew 17, but it is in Matthew 28 when Jesus has all authority, with the nail scars in his hands and the tomb that is empty, that we see Jesus' glory set on full display. As much as Peter hated the cross, as much as Peter hated Jesus talking about suffering and dying, Jesus' transfiguration on this mountain manifested the glory of the cross. It showed that it was necessary. In other words, the transfiguration unveils the hidden glory that would come through Jesus' suffering. Now, let's talk about the cross, the glory, and us as Christ's church. As we end off this sermon, as we end off this text, we've got to ask, okay, what does all this have to do with us? Sure, Jesus is the glorious Son of God. Sure, we get a preview of the resurrection. So what? Well, here it is. Peter had rightly proclaimed Jesus as the Christ, but he needed to see that Jesus was more than Peter could possibly fathom. Yes, he was the king, but he was the king and the servant. Yes, he was the lion, but he was the lion and the lamb. He was both. He would be conquered by death, and by being conquered, he would conquer the one who had the power over death. And so the transfiguration was a preview of the glory to come at the resurrection. Now, in this cross-shaped glory... There are all kinds of implications for us as the church. The author of Hebrews says that it was for the joy, it was for the joy that was set before Jesus that he endured the cross. Yes, the cross lay ahead. Yes, a cold, stony tomb waited for him, but that wasn't the final destination. There were things waiting beyond the cross. There was glory and joy and ascension and a throne at the right hand of God that waited beyond all of that. Peter, in the same way, needed to learn that same lesson, to know that there was joy beyond the crucifixions. He would be called to take up his cross. He would be called to die in in a way that he never even fathomed, to suffer unimaginably for the sake of Jesus. But to see that that suffering wasn't all that it, there was. To see that there was a joyful glory that lies beyond the suffering. My friends, there are some of you that have suffered terribly. You have lost grandchildren. We 
buried a son, a 31-year-old son, this last Saturday who was brutally murdered in Dallas. Some of you have incredible cancers growing in your body, and you know, and you fear. Some of you have been rejected by your family because of your faith in Jesus. My friends, yes, all those are crosses that you bear. But what happened after Jesus' cross? A resurrected, risen, glorious Savior who has promised the same for you. You may sacrifice life, limb, career, fame, comfort, wealth, safety. You know, some of you may lose your positions at your job because of your faith someday. That could happen. Do we trust that it's all loss and trash and rubbish compared to knowing the surpassing worth of Christ Jesus our Lord? Do we trust that? Peter would gradually come to that viewpoint. He would see that, and it would be only after the resurrection that he would see and learn that Jesus' glory would not come in temple, tabernacle, or in pitch battle with Rome. His glory would come through suffering and death. And that glory is what made him willing to stand in the face of the high priest and say, you decide whether I should fear the word of men or fear God. Where do you get that kind of power from? How does a fisherman who once denied Jesus, even calling down a curse on himself to try to prove that he didn't know Jesus, how does that scaredy cat fisherman become the fisherman who looks at the very same high priest who just mass murdered his Lord and say, you decide who I should obey? It's the resurrection glory that makes those kind of people I have friends in China at this moment who every Sunday have to decide whether they're going to go to church, not because of the COVID cases, but because of the police cars that are stationed out around the apartment building where they meet. And every week they have to decide, is it worth the fine? Is it worth getting drug out with handcuffs and watching our pastor go through another threat by the police? I have friends in China right now that are going through that. And all the ones that I know would tell you hands down it is worth it because they know who they will see. They know who they live for. My friends, we Americans right now, as American church, we, we do everything to avoid suffering. Everything to avoid suffering. Failing to realize that it's through suffering that God works His best glory and His best plan. We suggest new tabernacles. We suggest new paths to get to the the glory that we want. And my friends, can I just share something with you? If you have a plan, a path, or desire for glory that leads away from crosses, it is not the glory of Christ that you're looking for. The glory of Christ is found in crosses, in tombs. That's where the glory of Christ leads. You must be willing to bear that cross, but know that bearing those crosses are not in vain. The gory cross leads to glory of Christ, and the glory of Christ leads to open access, freedom to come to the presence of God. We mourn and complain at all the fears that lie ahead of us. We look at the crosses and we go, really? We have to bear that? My friends, there's some of us that are in danger of giving up the walk, giving up the way, giving up the Savior, because we know heavy crosses wait. Yes, those crosses are there. They wait you. Yes, those crosses are there, and you might die on them. You may have to nail unbelievable things to those crosses and watch in agony as things that you love are ripped from you. But can I just point you beyond that cross to the grave? Then let me point you even beyond where the king returns and opens that grave. The resurrected 
Christ and his glory makes all suffering worth it. Let's pray. Father God, we lift up to you our hearts and souls. Father, we ask that you make us willing to suffer for your glory so that we can behold and see with free, unveiled faces the glory of our Savior. We pray this in your Son's name. Amen. If you'd like to know more about the gospel that's been preached today about Christ crucified, buried, and risen, we would like to pray with you. For those of you that are here, elders, if you'll go to the back and make yourself ready to pray. Um, Deacons, you're welcome to do that as well. Um, If you would like to pray with us, we would like to pray. If if you're on video and you're watching this and you want to know more, then please email us, call us. We will be happy to meet with you one-on-one and personally to help you understand the gospel. God bless, my friends. Please stand with us and let us sing together. Come behold the wondrous mystery. But let's do this song. The um, Bible says to encourage us to sing or commands us to sing with understanding. So as we sing these songs and we uh, say these words, let us meditate and reflect on the beauty of these this verses. Um, it's the gospel expressed in song and as we sing let us behold him and and just as brother Justin said bask on his on his glory
Christ in power, resurrected, as we will be when He comes. seated. Many of you might have heard by now that um, Rodney's mother, Miss Joyce, has uh, passed on to be with her Savior last night. And uh, would you join me in praying for the Symes family? Uh, let's pray together. Heavenly Father, we are grateful for the knowledge and the, the power of the resurrection. Well, we thank you that this has been given to us, Jesus' resurrection has been given to us as a, a down payment, uh, Lord, as an engagement ring uh, to the fullness of glory that awaits us as we will be resurrected one day when you return, Lord Jesus. And so we cling this morning uh, to that hope. We ask especially that you would uh, remind uh, Rodney and his dad and his whole family of the, the hope of the resurrection of Jesus, that their eyes would be set firmly on the goodness and on the delight that uh, their mother and their wife um, and their uh, and Miss Joyce, Lord, that she is experiencing right now as she is uh, tasting uh, the riches of your hope and your glory fully. And yet, Lord, in this time uh, and where we are, we acknowledge that, uh, Lord, we are uh, broken and, and sad and uh, we hurt and experience uh, the loss. We remember even Jesus as he uh, heard of his friend uh, and his passing in Lazarus, and he wept. And so, Father, we, we don't want to dismiss that today, that we feel the weight of the fall as sin and death and brokenness uh, are, are just seem to permeate the air around us. And so we, we ache and we cry out to you, Lord Jesus, to send your spirit to minister to the Symes, Lord, to be with Rodney and to fill him with the comfort and grace that can only come by your supernatural power. Uh, Father, we pray on behalf of our brother and his entire family that you will continue to comfort him, be to him a comforter and a presence, and that he would be able to glorify you even as he uh, leads his family to the comfort that can only be experienced in you. So we pray that you would shine brightly, Lord Jesus, not just in Miss Joyce's life as you so clearly have, but even now uh, in her passing. Father, we pray that you will continue to help us as your church uh, to love well, uh, Lord, to be those who have beheld your glory, uh, who have seen you in grace and truth, and now turn uh, to show your glory to those around us. It's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Matthew chapter 5, verse 14 says, You are the light of the world. A city situated on a hill cannot be hidden. No one lights a lamp and puts it under a basket, but rather on a lampstand. And it gives light for all who are in the house. In the same way, let your light shine before others so that they may see your good works and give glory to your Father in heaven. Grace Church, may you go in peace sent into the world, those who have seen the light, to display the light to those around you. Amen. Amen. 